The history of botany examines the human effort to understand life on Earth by tracing the historical development of the discipline of botany, that part of natural science dealing with organisms traditionally treated as plants. Rudimentary botanical science began with empirically based plant lore passed from generation to generation in the oral traditions of Paleolithic hunter-gatherers. The first written records of plants were made in the Neolithic Revolution about 10,000 years ago as writing was developed in the settled agricultural communities where plants and animals were first domesticated. The first writings that show human curiosity about plants themselves, rather than the uses that could be made of them, appear in ancient Greece and ancient India. In ancient Greece, the teachings of Aristotle's student Theophrastus at the Lyceum in ancient Athens in about 350 BC are considered the starting point for Western botany. In ancient India, the Verksayurveda, attributed to Parasara, is also considered one of the earliest texts to describe various branches of botany. In Europe, botanical science was soon overshadowed by a medieval preoccupation with the medicinal properties of plants that lasted more than 1,000 years. During this time, the medicinal works of classical antiquity were reproduced in manuscripts and books called herbals. In China and the Arab world, the Greco-Roman work on medicinal plants was preserved and extended. In Europe the Renaissance of the 14th–17th centuries heralded a scientific revival during which botany gradually emerged from natural history as an independent science, distinct from medicine and agriculture. Herbals were replaced by floras, books that described the native plants of local regions. The invention of the microscope stimulated the study of plant anatomy, and the first carefully designed experiments in plant physiology were performed. With the expansion of trade and exploration beyond Europe, the many new plants being discovered were subjected to an increasingly rigorous process of naming, description, and classification. Progressively more sophisticated scientific technology has aided the development of contemporary botanical offshoots in the plant sciences, ranging from the applied fields of economic botany, to the detailed examination of the structure and function of plants and their interaction with the environment over many scales from the large-scale global significance of vegetation and plant communities through to the small scale of subjects like cell theory, molecular biology and plant biochemistry. Introduction Botany and zoology are, historically, the core disciplines of biology whose history is closely associated with the natural sciences chemistry, physics and geology. A distinction can be made between botanical science in a pure sense, as the study of plants themselves, and botany as applied science, which studies the human use of plants. Early natural history divided pure botany into three main streams morphology classification, anatomy and physiology, that is, external form, internal structure, and functional operation. The most obvious topics in applied botany are horticulture, forestry and agriculture although there are many others like weed science, plant pathology, floristry, pharmacognosa, economic botany and ethnobotany which lie outside modern courses in botany. Since the origin of botanical science there has been a progressive increase in the scope of the subject as technology has opened up new techniques and areas of study. Modern molecular systematics, for example, entails the principles and techniques of taxonomy, molecular biology, computer science and more. Within botany there are a number of sub-disciplines that focus on particular plant groups, each with their own range of related studies. Included here are, phycology, pteridology, bryology and paleobotany and their histories are treated elsewhere. To this list can be added mycology, the study of fungi, which were once treated as plants, but are now ranked as a unique kingdom. Ancient knowledge nomadic hunter-gatherer societies passed on, by oral tradition, what they knew about the different kinds of plants that they used for food, shelter, poisons, medicines, for ceremonies and rituals etc. The uses of plants by these pre-literate societies influenced the way the plants were named and classified. Their uses were embedded in folk taxonomies, the way they were grouped according to use in everyday communication. The nomadic lifestyle was drastically changed when settled communities were established in about 12 centers around the world during the Neolithic Revolution which extended from about 10,000 to 2,500 years ago depending on the region. With these communities came the development of the technology and skills needed for the domestication of plants and animals and the emergence of the written word provided evidence for the passing of systematic knowledge and culture from one generation to the next. Plant lore and plant selection during the Neolithic Revolution plant knowledge increased most obviously through the use of plants for food and medicine. 
All of today's staple foods were domesticated in prehistoric times as a gradual process of selection of higher yielding varieties took place, possibly unknowingly, over hundreds to thousands of years. Legumes were cultivated on all continents but cereals made up most of the regular diet. Rice in East Asia, wheat and barley in the Middle East, and maize in Central and South America. By Greco-Roman times popular food plants of today, including grapes, apples, figs, and olives, were being listed as named varieties in early manuscripts. Botanical authority William Stern has observed that, cultivated plants are mankind's most vital and precious heritage from remote antiquity. It is also from the Neolithic, in about 3000 BC, that we glimpse the first known illustrations of plants and read descriptions of impressive gardens in Egypt. However protobotany, the first pre-scientific written record of plants, did not begin with food. It was born out of the medicinal literature of Egypt, China, Mesopotamia and India. Botanical historian Alan Morton notes that agriculture was the occupation of the poor and uneducated, while medicine was the realm of socially influential shamans, priests, apothecaries, magicians and physicians, who were more likely to record their knowledge for posterity. Early botany Ancient India An early example of ancient Indian plant classification is found in the Rigveda, a collection of Vedic Sanskrit hymns from about 3700-3100 BP. Plants are divided into Vershka, Osadi and Varuda, with further subdivisions. The sacred Hindu text Atharvaveda divides plants into eight classes, Visaka, Manjari, Stambini, Prastanavati, Ekashranja, Pratanavati, Amsamati, and Kandini. The Taittiriya Samhita classifies the plant kingdom into Virksa, Vana and Drumma, Visaka, Sasa, Amsumali, Vratati, Stambini, Pratanavati, and Alasala. Other examples of early Indian taxonomy include Manu Smriti, the law book of Hindus, which classifies plants into eight major categories. Elaborate taxonomies also occur in the Sharaka Samhita, Sushruta Samhita and Vaisika. Ancient China In ancient China lists of different plants and herb concoctions for pharmaceutical purposes date back to at least the time of the Warring States. Many Chinese writers over the centuries contributed to the written knowledge of herbal pharmaceutics. The Han dynasty includes the notable work of the Wangdi Neijing and the famous pharmacologist Zhang Zhangjing. There were also the 11th century scientists and statesmen Su Song and Shen Kuo who compiled learned treatises on natural history, emphasizing herbal medicine. Theophrastus and the origin of botanical science Ancient Athens, of the 6th century BC, was the busy trade center at the confluence of Egyptian, Mesopotamian and Minoan cultures at the height of Greek colonization of the Mediterranean. The philosophical thought of this period ranged freely through many subjects. Empedocles foreshadowed Darwinian evolutionary theory and a crude formulation of the mutability of species and natural selection. The physician Hippocrates avoided the prevailing superstition of his day and approached healing by close observation and the test of experience. At this time a genuine non-anthropocentric curiosity about plants emerged. The major works written about plants extended beyond the description of their medicinal uses to the topics of plant geography, morphology, physiology, nutrition, growth and reproduction. Foremost among the scholars studying botany was Theophrastus of Erisus who has been frequently referred to as the «father of botany». He was a student and close friend of Aristotle and succeeded him as head of the Lyceum in Athens with its tradition of peripatetic philosophy. Aristotle's special treatise on plants, Theoria peri phyton, is now lost. Although there are many botanical observations scattered throughout his other writings but they give little insight into his botanical thinking. The Lyceum prided itself in a tradition of systematic observation of causal connections, critical experiment and rational theorizing. Theophrastus challenged the superstitious medicine employed by the physicians of his day, called rhizotomy, and also the control over medicine exerted by priestly authority and tradition. Together with Aristotle he had tutored Alexander the Great whose military conquests were carried out with all the scientific resources of the day, the Lyceum Garden probably containing many botanical trophies collected during his campaigns as well as other explorations in distant lands. It was in this garden where he gained much of his plant knowledge. Theophrastus's major botanical works were the Enquiry into Plants and Causes of Plants which were his lecture notes for the Lyceum. The opening sentence of the enquiry reads like a botanical manifesto. 
We must consider the distinctive characters and the general nature of plants from the point of view of their morphology, their behavior under external conditions, their mode of generation and the whole course of their life. The enquiry is nine books of, applied, botany dealing with the forms and classification of plants and economic botany, examining the techniques of agriculture and horticulture. He described some 500 plants in detail, often including descriptions of habitat and geographic distribution, and he recognized some plant groups that can be recognized as modern-day plant families. Some names he used, like Critigus, Dacus and Asparagus have persisted until today. His second book Causes of Plants covers plant growth and reproduction. Like Aristotle he grouped plants into, trees, undershrubs shrubs, and, herbs. But he also made several other important botanical distinctions and observations. He noted that plants could be annuals, perennials and biennials, they were also either monocotyledons or dicotyledons and he also noticed the difference between determinate and indeterminate growth and details of floral structure including the degree of fusion of the petals, position of the ovary and more. These lecture notes of Theophrastus comprise the first clear exposition of the rudiments of plant anatomy, physiology, morphology and ecology, presented in a way that would not be matched for another 18 centuries. Meanwhile, the study of medicinal plants was not being neglected and a full synthesis of ancient Greek pharmacology was compiled in Materia Medica c. 60 AD by Padanius Dioscorides who was a Greek physician with the Roman army. This work proved to be the definitive text on medicinal herbs, both Oriental and Occidental, for 1500 years until the dawn of the European Renaissance being slavishly copied again and again throughout this period. Though rich in medicinal information with descriptions of about 600 medicinal herbs, the botanical content of the work was extremely limited. Ancient Rome The Romans contributed little to the foundations of botanical science laid by the ancient Greeks, but made a sound contribution to our knowledge of applied botany as agriculture. In works titled De Re Rustica four Roman writers contributed to a compendium scriptores Re Rustici published from the Renaissance on, which set out the principles and practice of agriculture. These authors were Cato, Varro and, in particular, Columella and Palladius. Roman encyclopedist Pliny the Elder deals with plants in books 12–26 of his 37-volume highly influential work Naturalis Historia in which he frequently quotes Theophrastus but with a lack of botanical insight although he does, nevertheless, draw a distinction between true botany on the one hand, and farming and medicine on the other. It is estimated that at the time of the Roman Empire between 1300 and 1400 plants had been recorded in the West. Medieval knowledge Medicinal plants of the early Middle Ages in Western Europe, after Theophrastus, botany passed through a bleak period of 1800 years when little progress was made and, indeed, many of the early insights were lost. As Europe entered the Middle Ages, China, India and the Arab world enjoyed a golden age. Chinese philosophy had followed a similar path to that of the ancient Greeks. The Chinese dictionary Encyclopedia Erh Ya probably dates from about 300 BC and describes about 334 plants classed as trees or shrubs, each with a common name and illustration. Between 100 and 1700 AD many new works on pharmaceutical botany were produced including encyclopedic accounts and treatises compiled for the Chinese imperial court. These were free of superstition and myth with carefully researched descriptions and nomenclature. They included cultivation information and notes on economic and medicinal uses, and even elaborate monographs on ornamental plants. But there was no experimental method and no analysis of the plant sexual system, nutrition, or anatomy. The 400-year period from the 9th to 13th centuries AD was the Islamic Renaissance, a time when Islamic culture and science thrived. Greco-Roman texts were preserved, copied and extended although new texts always emphasized the medicinal aspects of plants. Kurdish biologist Abu Hanifa Ahmad ibn Dawud Dinawari is known as the founder of Arabic botany. His Kitab al-Nabat describes 637 species discussing plant development from germination to senescence and including details of flowers and fruits. The Metazolite philosopher and physician Ibn Sina was another influential figure, his The Canon of Medicine being a landmark in the history of medicine treasured until the Enlightenment. In India simple artificial plant classification systems of the Rigveda, Atharvaveda and Taittiriya Samhita became more botanical with the work of Parasara, the author of Verksayarveda. 
He made close observations of cells and leaves and divided plants into Devimadarka and Ekamadarka. The dicotyledons were further classified into groupings akin to modern floral families Samagania, Puplicagalnia, Svastikagania, Tripaspagania, Malakagania, and Kirkapaspagania. Important medieval Indian works of plant physiology include the Pyarthviniraparium of Udayana, Nyayavindutika of Dharmatara, Siddharsana Samakaya of Gunaratna, and Upaskara of Sankaramisra. The Silk Road following the fall of Constantinople, the newly expanded Ottoman Empire welcomed European embassies in its capital, which in turn became the sources of plants from those regions to the east which traded with the empire. In the following century 20 times as many plants entered Europe along the Silk Road as had been transported in the previous 2,000 years, mainly as bulbs. Others were acquired primarily for their alleged medicinal value. Initially Italy benefited from this new knowledge, especially Venice, which traded extensively with the East. From there these new plants rapidly spread to the rest of Western Europe. By the middle of the 16th century there was already a flourishing export trade of various bulbs from Turkey to Europe. The age of herbals in the European Middle Ages of the 15th and 16th centuries the lives of European citizens were based around agriculture but when printing arrived, with movable type and woodcut illustrations, it was not treatises on agriculture that were published, but lists of medicinal plants with descriptions of their properties or virtues. These first plant books, known as herbals showed that botany was still a part of medicine, as it had been for most of ancient history. Authors of herbals were often curators of university gardens, and most herbals were derivative compilations of classic texts, especially De Materia Medica. However, the need for accurate and detailed plant descriptions meant that some herbals were more botanical than medicinal. German Otto Brunfels's Herbarum vivi icons contained descriptions of about 47 species new to science combined with accurate illustrations. His fellow countryman Hieronymus Box Kreuterbeck of 1539 described plants he found in nearby woods and fields and these were illustrated in the 1546 edition. However, it was Valerius Cordus who pioneered the formal botanical description that detailed both flowers and fruits, some anatomy including the number of chambers in the ovary, and the type of ovule placentation. He also made observations on pollen and distinguished between inflorescence types. His five-volume Historia Plantarum was published about 18 years after his early death aged 29 in 1561–1563. In Holland Rembert Dodoens, in Sterpium Historiae, included descriptions of many new species from the Netherlands in a scientific arrangement and in England William Turner in his Libellus de Re Herbaria Novus published names, descriptions and localities of many native British plants. Herbals contributed to botany by setting in train the science of plant description, classification, and botanical illustration. Up to the 17th century botany and medicine were one and the same but those books emphasizing medicinal aspects eventually omitted the plant lore to become modern pharmacopoeias. Those that omitted the medicine became more botanical and evolved into the modern compilations of plant descriptions we call floras. These were often backed by specimens deposited in a herbarium which was a collection of dried plants that verified the plant descriptions given in the floras. The transition from herbal to flora marked the final separation of botany from medicine. The Renaissance and Age of Enlightenment the revival of learning during the European Renaissance renewed interest in plants. The church, feudal aristocracy and an increasingly influential merchant class that supported science and the arts, now jostled in a world of increasing trade. Sea voyages of exploration returned botanical treasures to the large public, private, and newly established botanic gardens, and introduced an eager population to novel crops, drugs and spices from Asia, the East Indies and the New World. The number of scientific publications increased. In England, for example, scientific communication and causes were facilitated by learned societies like Royal Society and the Linnaean Society. There was also the support and activities of botanical institutions like the Jardin du Roy in Paris, Chelsea Physic Garden, Royal Botanic Gardens Kew, and the Oxford and Cambridge Botanic Gardens, as well as the influence of renowned private gardens and wealthy entrepreneurial nurserymen. By the early 17th century the number of plants described in Europe had risen to about 6,000. The 18th century Enlightenment values of reason and science coupled with new voyages to distant lands instigating another phase of encyclopedic plant identification, nomenclature, description and illustration, 
flower painting, possibly at its best in this period of history. Plant trophies from distant lands decorated the gardens of Europe's powerful and wealthy in a period of enthusiasm for natural history, especially botany that is never likely to recur. Often such exotic new plant imports, when they first appeared in print in English, lacked common names in the language. During the 18th century botany was one of the few sciences considered appropriate for genteel educated women. Around 1760, with the popularization of the Linnaean system, Botany became much more widespread among educated women who painted plants, attended classes on plant classification, and collected herbarium specimens although emphasis was on the healing properties of plants rather than plant reproduction which had overtones of sexuality. Women began publishing on botanical topics and children's books on botany appeared by authors like Charlotte Turner Smith. Cultural authorities argued that education through botany created culturally and scientifically aware citizens part of the thrust for «improvement» that characterized the Enlightenment. However, in the early 19th century with the recognition of botany as an official science, women were again excluded from the discipline. Botanical gardens and herbaria public and private gardens have always been strongly associated with the historical unfolding of botanical science. Early botanical gardens were physic gardens, repositories for the medicinal plants described in the herbals. As they were generally associated with universities or other academic institutions the plants were also used for study. The directors of these gardens were eminent physicians with an educational role as «scientific gardeners», and it was staff of these institutions that produced many of the published herbals. The botanical gardens of the modern tradition were established in northern Italy, the first being at Pisa, founded by Luca Ghini. Although part of a medical faculty, the first chair of Materia Medica, essentially a chair in botany, was established in Padua in 1533. Then in 1534, Ghini became reader in Materia Medica at Bologna University, where Ulisse Aldrovandi established a similar garden in 1568. Collections of pressed and dried specimens were called a hortus siccus and the first accumulation of plants in this way is attributed to Ghini. Buildings called herbaria housed these specimens mounted on card with descriptive labels. Stored in cupboards in systematic order they could be preserved in perpetuity and easily transferred or exchanged with other institutions, a taxonomic procedure that is still used today. By the 18th century the physic gardens had been transformed into «order beds» that demonstrated the classification systems that were being devised by botanists of the day, but they also had to accommodate the influx of curious, beautiful and new plants pouring in from voyages of exploration that were associated with European colonial expansion. From herbal to flora plant classification systems of the 17th and 18th centuries now related plants to one another and not to man, marking a return to the non-anthropocentric botanical science promoted by Theophrastus over 1500 years before. In England, various herbals in either Latin or English were mainly compilations and translations of continental European works, of limited relevance to the British Isles. This included the rather unreliable work of Gerard. The first systematic attempt to collect information on British plants was that of Thomas Johnson, who was later to issue his own revision of Gerard's work. However Johnson was not the first apothecary or physician to organize botanical expeditions to systematize their local flora. In Italy Ulisse Aldrovandi organized an expedition to the Sibylline Mountains in Umbria in 1557, and compiled a local flora. He then began to disseminate his findings amongst other European scholars, forming an early network of knowledge sharing, multi amici and multi luaghi, including Charles de Lacluse at Montpelier and Jean de Branchon at Malins. Between them they started developing Latin names for plants, in addition to their common names. The exchange of information and specimens between scholars was often associated with the founding of botanical gardens, and to this end Aldrovandi founded one of the earliest at his university in Bologna, the Orto Botanico di Bologna in 1568. In France, Clusius journeyed throughout most of Western Europe, making discoveries in the vegetable kingdom along the way. He compiled flora of Spain, and Austria and Hungary. He was the first to propose dividing plants into classes. Meanwhile, in Switzerland, from 1554, Conrad Gessner made regular explorations of the Swiss Alps from his native Zurich and discovered many new plants. He proposed that there were groups or genera of plants. He said that each genus was composed of many species and that these were defined by similar flowers and fruits. 
This principle of organization laid the groundwork for future botanists. He wrote his important Historia Plantarum shortly before his death. At Malins, in Flanders he established and maintained the botanical gardens of Jean de Branchon from 1568 to 1573, and first encountered tulips. This approach coupled with the new Linnaean system of binomial nomenclature resulted in plant encyclopedias without medicinal information called floras that meticulously described and illustrated the plants growing in particular regions. The 17th century also marked the beginning of experimental botany and application of a rigorous scientific method, while improvements in the microscope launched the new discipline of plant anatomy whose foundations, laid by the careful observations of Englishman Nehemiah Gru and Italian Marcello Malpighi, would last for 150 years. Botanical exploration more new lands were opening up to European colonial powers, the botanical riches being returned to European botanists for description. This was a romantic era of botanical explorers, intrepid plant hunters and gardener botanists. Significant botanical collections came from the West Indies, China, the Spice Islands of the East Indies, China and Mozambique, West Africa, who devised his own classification scheme and forwarded a crude theory of the mutability of species. Canada, Hebrides, Iceland, New Zealand by Captain James Cook's chief botanist Joseph Banks. Classification and morphology By the middle of the 18th century the botanical booty resulting from the era of exploration was accumulating in gardens and herbaria, and it needed to be systematically catalogued. This was the task of the taxonomists, the plant classifiers. Plant classifications have changed over time from, artificial, systems based on general habit and form, to pre-evolutionary, natural, systems expressing similarity using one-to-many characters, leading to post-evolutionary, natural, systems that use characters to infer evolutionary relationships. Italian physician Andrea Cicilpino studied medicine and taught botany at the University of Pisa for about 40 years eventually becoming director of the Botanic Garden of Pisa from 1554 to 1558. His 16 volume De Plantis described 1500 plants and his herbarium of 260 pages and 768 mounted specimens still remains. Cicilpino proposed classes based largely on the detailed structure of the flowers and fruit. He also applied the concept of the genus. He was the first to try and derive principles of natural classification reflecting the overall similarities between plants and he produced a classification scheme well in advance of its day. Gaspard Bauhin produced two influential publications Prodromus Theatrici Botanici and Pinnix. These brought order to the 6,000 species now described and in the latter he used binomials and synonyms that may well have influenced Linnaeus's thinking. He also insisted that taxonomy should be based on natural affinities. To sharpen the precision of description and classification Joachim Jung compiled a much-needed botanical terminology which has stood the test of time. English botanist John Ray built on Jung's work to establish the most elaborate and insightful classification system of the day. His observation started with the local plants of Cambridge where he lived, with the Catalogus Sterpium circa Cantabrigium Nascentium which later expanded to his Synopsis Methodica Sterpium Britannicarum, essentially the first British flora. Although his Historia Plantarum provided a step towards a world flora as he included more and more plants from his travels, first on the continent and then beyond. He extended Cicilpino's natural system with a more precise definition of the higher classification levels, deriving many modern families in the process, and asserted that all parts of plants were important in classification. He recognized that variation arises from both internal and external environmental causes and that only the former was of taxonomic significance. He was also among the first experimental physiologists. The Historia Plantarum can be regarded as the first botanical synthesis and textbook for modern botany. According to botanical historian Alan Morton, Ray influenced both the theory and the practice of botany more decisively than any other single person in the latter half of the 17th century. Ray's family system was later extended by Pierre Magnol and Joseph de Tornfort, a student of Magnol, achieved notoriety for his botanical expeditions, his emphasis on floral characters in classification, and for reviving the idea of the genus as the basic unit of classification. Above all, it was Swedish Carl Linnaeus who eased the task of plant cataloging. He adopted a sexual system of classification using stamens and pistils as important characters. Among his most important publications were Systema Natura, 
genera Plantarum, and Philosophia Botanica but it was in his species Plantarum that he gave every species a binomial thus setting the path for the future accepted method of designating the names of all organisms. Linnaean thought and books dominated the world of taxonomy for nearly a century. His sexual system was later elaborated by Bernard de Jussieu whose nephew Antoine Laurent de Jussieu extended it yet again to include about 100 orders. Frenchman Michel Adinson in his Famille des Plants, apart from extending the current system of family names, emphasized that a natural classification must be based on a consideration of all characters, even though these may later be given different emphasis according to their diagnostic value for the particular plant group. Adinson's method has, in essence, been followed to this day. 18th century plant taxonomy bequeathed to the 19th century a precise binomial nomenclature and botanical terminology a system of classification based on natural affinities, and a clear idea of the ranks of family, genus and species, although the taxa to be placed within these ranks remains, as always, the subject of taxonomic research. Anatomy in the first half of the 18th century botany was beginning to move beyond descriptive science into experimental science. Although the microscope was invented in 1590 it was only in the late 17th century that lens grinding provided the resolution needed to make major discoveries. Antony van Leeuwenhoek is a notable example of an early lens grinder who achieved remarkable resolution with his single lens microscopes. Important general biological observations were made by Robert Hooke but the foundations of plant anatomy were laid by Italian Marcello Malpighi of the University of Bologna in his Anatome Plantarum and Royal Society Englishman Nehemiah grew in his The Anatomy of Plants begun in Anatomy of Plants. These botanists explored what is now called developmental anatomy and morphology by carefully observing, describing and drawing the developmental transition from seed to mature plant, recording stem and wood formation. This work included the discovery and naming of parenchyma and stomata. Physiology and plant physiology research interest was focused on the movement of sap and the absorption of substances through the roots. Jan Helmont by experimental observation and calculation, noted that the increase in weight of a growing plant cannot be derived purely from the soil, and concluded it must relate to water uptake. Englishman Stephen Hales established by quantitative experiment that there is uptake of water by plants and a loss of water by transpiration and that this is influenced by environmental conditions. He distinguished, root pressure, leaf suction, and, imbibition, and also noted that the major direction of sap flow in woody tissue is upward. His results were published in Vegetable Statics he also noted that, air makes a very considerable part of the substance of vegetables. English chemist Joseph Priestley is noted for his discovery of oxygen and its production by plants. Later Jan Ingenhausch observed that only in sunlight do the green parts of plants absorb air and release oxygen, this being more rapid in bright sunlight while, at night, the air is released from all parts. His results were published in experiments upon vegetables and with this the foundations for 20th century studies of carbon fixation were laid. From his observations he sketched the cycle of carbon in nature even though the composition of carbon dioxide was yet to be resolved. Studies in plant nutrition had also progressed. In 1804 Nicolas Théodore de Saussure's Recherches chimiques sur la végétation was an exemplary study of scientific exactitude that demonstrated the similarity of respiration in both plants and animals, that the fixation of carbon dioxide includes water, and that just minute amounts of salts and nutrients have a powerful influence on plant growth. Plant sexuality It was Rudolf Camerarius who was the first to establish plant sexuality conclusively by experiment. He declared in a letter to a colleague dated 1694 entitled De Sexu Plantarum Epistola that, no ovules of plants could ever develop into seeds from the female style and ovary without first being prepared by the pollen from the stamens, the male sexual organs of the plant. Much was learned about plant sexuality by unraveling the reproductive mechanisms of mosses, liverworts and algae. In his Vergleichen Untersuchungen of 1851 Wilhelm Hofmeister starting with the ferns and bryophytes demonstrated that the process of sexual reproduction in plants entails an alternation of generations, between sporophytes and gametophytes. This initiated the new field of comparative morphology which, largely through the combined work of William Farlow, Nathaniel Pringsheim, Frederick Bauer, Eduard Strasburger and others, established that an alternation of generations occurs throughout the plant kingdom. 
Some time later the German academic and natural historian Joseph Kohlreuter extended this work by noting the function of nectar in attracting pollinators and the role of wind and insects in pollination. He also produced deliberate hybrids, observed the microscopic structure of pollen grains and how the transfer of matter from the pollen to the ovary inducing the formation of the embryo. One hundred years after Camerarius, in 1793, Christian Sprengel broadened the understanding of flowers by describing the role of nectar guides in pollination, the adaptive floral mechanisms used for pollination, and the prevalence of cross-pollination, even though male and female parts are usually together on the same flower. Nineteenth-century foundations of modern botany and about the mid-nineteenth century scientific communication changed. Until this time ideas were largely exchanged by reading the works of authoritative individuals who dominated in their field. These were often wealthy and influential gentlemen scientists. Now research was reported by the publication of papers that emanated from research schools that promoted the questioning of conventional wisdom. This process had started in the late 18th century when specialist journals began to appear. Even so, Botany was greatly stimulated by the appearance of the first modern textbook, Matthias Schleiden's Grundsüge der Wissenschaftlichen Botanik, published in English in 1849 as Principles of Scientific Botany. By 1850 an invigorated organic chemistry had revealed the structure of many plant constituents. Although the great era of plant classification had now passed the work of description continued. Augustin de Candel succeeded Antoine Laurent de Jussieu in managing the botanical project Prodromus Systematis Naturalis Regna Vegetabilis which involved 35 authors. It contained all the dicotyledons known in his day, some 58,000 species in 161 families, and he doubled the number of recognized plant families, the work being completed by his son Alphonse in the years from 1841 to 1873. Plant geography and the opening of the 19th century was marked by an increase in interest in the connection between climate and plant distribution. Carl Wildnow examined the connection between seed dispersal and distribution, the nature of plant associations and the impact of geological history. He noticed the similarities between the floras of N America and N Asia, the Cape and Australia, and he explored the ideas of «center of diversity» and «center of origin». German Alexander von Humboldt and Frenchman Amy Bonplan published a massive and highly influential 30-volume work on their travels. Robert Brown noted the similarities between the floras of S. Africa, Australia and India, while Joachim Schau explored more deeply than anyone else the influence on plant distribution of temperature, soil factors, especially soil water, and light, work that was continued by Alphonse de Candel. Joseph Hooker pushed the boundaries of floristic studies with his work on Antarctica, India and the Middle East with special attention to endemism. August Griesbach in Die Vegetation der Erde examined physiognomy in relation to climate and in America geographic studies were pioneered by Asa Gray. Physiological plant geography or ecology, emerged from floristic biogeography in the late 19th century as environmental influences on plants received greater recognition. Early work in this area was synthesized by Danish professor Eugenius Warming in his book Plantisamfund including new ideas on plant communities, their adaptations and environmental influences. This was followed by another grand synthesis, the Pflanzengeographie auf physiologischer Grundlage of Andreas Schimper in 1898 Anatomyecology During the 19th century German scientists led the way towards a unitary theory of the structure and life cycle of plants. Following improvements in the microscope at the end of the 18th century, Charles Merble in 1802 published his Traité d'anatomie et de physiologie végétale and Johann Moldenhauer published Beiträge zur anatomie der Pflanzen in which he describes techniques for separating cells from the middle lamella. He identified vascular and parenchymatous tissues, described vascular bundles, observed the cells in the cambium, and interpreted tree rings. He found that stomata were composed of pairs of cells, rather than a single cell with a whole. Anatomical studies on the steel were consolidated by Carl Sanio who described the secondary tissues and meristem including cambium and its action. Hugo von Moll summarized work in anatomy leading up to 1850 in Die Vegetabilische Zell but this work was later eclipsed by the Encyclopedic Comparative Anatomy of Heinrich Anton de Berry in 1877. An overview of knowledge of the steel in root and stem was completed by Van Tegum and of the meristem by Karl Nagele. 
Studies had also begun on the origins of the carpal and flower that continue to the present day. Water relations The riddle of water and nutrient transport through the plant remained. Physiologist von Moll explored solute transport and the theory of water uptake by the roots using the concepts of cohesion, transpirational pull, capillarity and root pressure. German dominance in the field of physiology was underlined by the publication of the definitive textbook on plant physiology synthesizing the work of this period, Sachs Vorlsungen über Pflanzenphysiologie of 1882. There were, however, some advances elsewhere such as the early exploration of geotropism by Englishman Thomas Knight, and the discovery and naming of osmosis by Frenchman Henri Dutrochet. Cytology The cell nucleus was discovered by Robert Brown in 1831. Demonstration of the cellular composition of all organisms, with each cell possessing all the characteristics of life, is attributed to the combined efforts of botanist Matthias Schleiden and zoologist Theodor Schwann in the early 19th century although Moldenhaar had already shown that plants were wholly cellular with each cell having its own wall and Julius von Sachs had shown the continuity protoplasm between cell walls. From 1870 to 1880 it became clear that cell nuclei are never formed anew but always derived from the substance of another nucleus. In 1882 Fleming observed the longitudinal splitting of chromosomes in the dividing nucleus and concluded that each daughter nucleus received half of each of the chromosomes of the mother nucleus. Then by the early 20th century it was found that the number of chromosomes in a given species is constant. With genetic continuity confirmed and the finding by Eduard Strasburger that the nuclei of reproductive cells have a reducing division the field of heredity was opened up. By 1926 Thomas Morgan was able to outline a theory of the gene and its structure and function. The form and function of plastids received similar attention, the association with starch being noted at an early date. With observation of the cellular structure of all organisms and the process of cell division and continuity of genetic material, the analysis of the structure of protoplasm and the cell wall as well as that of plastids and vacuoles. What is now known as cytology, or cell theory became firmly established. Later, the cytological basis of the gene chromosome theory of heredity extended from about 1900 to 1944 and was initiated by the rediscovery of Gregor Mendel's Laws of Plant Heredity first published in 1866 in experiments on plant hybridization and based on cultivated P. Pisum sativum. This heralded the opening up of plant genetics. The cytological basis for gene chromosome theory was explored through the role of polyploidy and hybridization in speciation and it was becoming better understood that interbreeding populations were the unit of adaptive change in biology. Developmental morphology and evolution Until the 1860s it was believed that species had remained unchanged through time. Each biological form was the result of an independent act of creation and therefore absolutely distinct and immutable. But the hard reality of geological formations and strange fossils needed scientific explanation. Charles Darwin's origin of species replaced the assumption of constancy with the theory of descent with modification. Phylogeny became a new principle as natural classifications became classifications reflecting, not just similarities, but evolutionary relationships. Wilhelm Hofmeister established that there was a similar pattern of organization in all plants expressed through the alternation of generations and extensive homology of structures. Polymath German intellect Johann Goethe had interests and influence that extended into botany. In Die Metamorphose der Pflanzen he provided a theory of plant morphology and he included within his concept of, metamorphosis, modification during evolution, thus linking comparative morphology with phylogeny. Though the botanical basis of his work has been challenged there is no doubt that he prompted discussion and research on the origin and function of floral parts. His theory probably stimulated the opposing views of German botanists Alexander Braun and Matthias Schleiden who applied the experimental method to the principles of growth and form that were later extended by Augustin de Candel. Carbon fixation at the start of the 19th century The idea that plants could synthesize almost all their tissues from atmospheric gases had not yet emerged. The energy component of photosynthesis, the capture and storage of the sun's radiant energy in carbon bonds was first elucidated in 1847 by Mayer, but the details of how this was done would take many more years. Chlorophyll was named in 1818 and its chemistry gradually determined, to be finally resolved in the early 20th century. 
The mechanism of photosynthesis remained a mystery until the mid-19th century when Sachs, in 1862, noted that starch was formed in green cells only in the presence of light and in 1882 he confirmed carbohydrates as the starting point for all other organic compounds and plants. The connection between the pigment chlorophyll and starch production was finally made in 1864 but tracing the precise biochemical pathway of starch formation did not begin until about 1915. Nitrogen fixation significant discoveries relating to nitrogen assimilation and metabolism, including ammonification, nitrification and nitrogen fixation had to wait for advances in chemistry and bacteriology in the late 19th century and this was followed in the early 20th century by the elucidation of protein and amino acid synthesis and their role in plant metabolism. With this knowledge it was then possible to outline the global nitrogen cycle. 20th century 20th century science grew out of the solid foundations laid by the breadth of vision and detailed experimental observations of the 19th century. A vastly increased research force was now rapidly extending the horizons of botanical knowledge at all levels of plant organization from molecules to global plant ecology. There was now an awareness of the unity of biological structure and function at the cellular and biochemical levels of organization. Botanical advance was closely associated with advances in physics and chemistry with the greatest advances in the 20th century mainly relating to the penetration of molecular organization. However, at the level of plant communities it would take until mid-century to consolidate work on ecology and population genetics. By 1910 experiments using labeled isotopes were being used to elucidate plant biochemical pathways, to open the line of research leading to gene technology. On a more practical level research funding was now becoming available from agriculture and industry. Molecules in 1903 chlorophylls A and B were separated by thin layer chromatography then, through the 1920s and 1930s, biochemists, notably Hans Krebs and Karl and Gerdy Corey began tracing out the central metabolic pathways of life. Between the 1930s and 1950s it was determined that ATP, located in mitochondria, was the source of cellular chemical energy and the constituent reactions of photosynthesis were progressively revealed. Then, in 1944 DNA was extracted for the first time. Along with these revelations there was the discovery of plant hormones or, growth substances, notably auxins, gibberellins and cytokinins and the effects of photoperiodism, the control of plant processes, especially flowering, by the relative lengths of day and night. Following the establishment of Mendel's laws, the gene chromosome theory of heredity was confirmed by the work of August Weissmann who identified chromosomes as the hereditary material. Also, in observing the halving of the chromosome number in germ cells he anticipated work to follow on the details of meiosis, the complex process of redistribution of hereditary material that occurs in the germ cells. In the 1920s and 1930s population genetics combined the theory of evolution with Mendelian genetics to produce the modern synthesis. By the mid-1960s the molecular basis of metabolism and reproduction was firmly established through the new discipline of molecular biology. Genetic engineering, the insertion of genes into a host cell for cloning, began in the 1970s with the invention of recombinant DNA techniques and its commercial applications applied to agricultural crops followed in the 1990s. There was now the potential to identify organisms by molecular fingerprinting, and to estimate the times in the past when critical evolutionary changes had occurred through the use of molecular clocks. Computers, electron microscopes and evolution increased experimental precision combined with vastly improved scientific instrumentation was opening up exciting new fields. In 1936 Alexander Aperin demonstrated a possible mechanism for the synthesis of organic matter from inorganic molecules. In the 1960s it was determined that the Earth's earliest life forms treated as plants, the cyanobacteria known as stromatolites, dated back some 3.5 billion years. Mid-century transmission and scanning electron microscopy presented another level of resolution to the structure of matter, taking anatomy into the new world of, ultrastructure. New and revised, phylogenetic, classification systems of the plant kingdom were produced by several botanists, including August Eichler. A massive 23-volume Die Natterlichen Pflanzenfamilien was published by Adolf Engler and Karl Prantl over the period 1887–1915. Taxonomy based on gross morphology was now being supplemented by using characters revealed by pollen morphology, embryology, anatomy, 
cytology, serology, macromolecules and more. The introduction of computers facilitated the rapid analysis of large datasets used for numerical taxonomy. The emphasis on truly natural phylogeny spawned the disciplines of cladistics and phylogenetic systematics. The grand taxonomic synthesis and integrated system of classification of flowering plants of American Arthur Cronquist was superseded when, in 1998, the Angiosperm Phylogeny Group published a phylogeny of flowering plants based on the analysis of DNA sequences using the techniques of the new molecular systematics which was resolving questions concerning the earliest evolutionary branches of the angiosperms. The exact relationship of fungi to plants had for some time been uncertain. Several lines of evidence pointed to fungi being different from plants, animals and bacteria, indeed, more closely related to animals than plants. In the 1980s to 90s molecular analysis revealed an evolutionary divergence of fungi from other organisms about one billion year ago, sufficient reason to erect a unique kingdom separate from plants. Biogeography and Ecology The publication of Alfred Wegener's Theory of Continental Drift 1912 gave additional impetus to comparative physiology and the study of biogeography while ecology in the 1930s contributed the important ideas of plant community, succession, community change, and energy flows. From 1940 to 1950 ecology matured to become an independent discipline as Eugene Odom formulated many of the concepts of ecosystem ecology emphasizing relationships between groups of organisms as key factors in the field. Building on the extensive earlier work of Alphonse de Candle, Nikolai Vavilov from 1914 to 1940 produced accounts of the geography, centers of origin, and evolutionary history of economic plants. 21st century In reviewing the sweep of botanical history it is evident that, through the power of the scientific method, most of the basic questions concerning the structure and function of plants have, in principle, been resolved. Now the distinction between pure and applied botany becomes blurred as our historically accumulated botanical wisdom at all levels of plant organization is needed to improve human custodianship of planet Earth. The most urgent unanswered botanical questions now relate to the role of plants as primary producers in the global cycling of life's basic ingredients — energy, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and ways that our plant stewardship can help address the global environmental issues of resource management, conservation, human food security, biologically invasive organisms, carbon sequestration, climate change, and sustainability.